and then you can sacrifice that. So God always gives us a, a solution to our problems. And that's what he did in Jerusalem. And that's where we um, get the money changers and all the other problems that happen later on. Uh, let's see what's this. Oh, um, and the importance behind Deuteronomy verse 26 is to in indicate that the type of the tithe isn't important, but it's, it's the thought behind it. That we are willing to give God um, the first of what we have, no matter what it is. It could be cattle, it could be wine, it could be money. As long as we give the first, the best, give our best to God. And then he leaves in verse 27, he tells us, Don't neglect the Levites who are living in your towns, for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. Now the Levites, of course, they are to serve God solely. They aren't to have any other jobs. They, um, they don't have much of anything. All they have is a house to live in. So God is saying, don't forgive, forget them, even the ones living in your town. Because there were Levites spread all over the place so they could be there to take care of the people. Just like we had... Like a slave culture? No, no, no. Think of, think of pastors. Um, where, well, not, not that, you know, we're poor, but that they were in every town to take care of people. So if, if you guys had or to go teachers. to... teachers. Or teachers, exactly, exactly. Yes. Teachers, teachers, preachers, and, and uh -huh. prophets. Or hairdressers. Or ha I could go on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nowadays, the list goes on. The list goes on. So, yeah, there were Levites in every town. So just like small congregations. Um, and even now in uh, predominantly Jewish areas, you can, you can see that carried out because there's a, a temple um, within walking distance of any large group of, of uh, Jewish people. Because remember, um, on the Sabbath that starts on Friday night, they can't drive, they can't use the phone, they can't cook. So they need to walk to the temple. So that's why in larger Jewish areas there's a lot of little temples everywhere. So just a little little tidbits. Little tidbits. Um, and we saw that because we lived in Arlington Heights and Buffalo Grove, the next town north of us, was predominantly Jewish and they had quite a few temples that people could walk to. Um, and then one real big temple. Let's see here. Uh, verse 28 and 29. So here God's talking about every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and stores in your towns so that the Levites, the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your town may come, eat, and be satisfied. Now there's two reasons for that. One reason is that God doesn't want anybody to be poor. God doesn't want anybody to suffer. And also, what you were going to do when you brought your, your three-year tithe, you were going to eat with those people. You were going to celebrate with those people because God loves a cheerful giver, as we hear in um, 2 Corinthians, uh, where Paul tells us, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. He wanted, he wanted the rich people in town to celebrate with the poor people, and... Um, he didn't want any, um, not what now is called toxic charity, where some people give, give money and then they lord it over the people that they give it to. Here God's saying, no, you're all the same. You just have more blessings than these people. We're racing through this. That's okay. Um, Deuteronomy 15. Any questions of what we've gone through so far? Back up to the uh, killing, slaughtering of the animals. Okay. Um, we're farm people and remember, you know, killing the beef or the pork and hanging it in a tree or a driveway thing. Is that any reasoning, you know, did we bring that to, from biblical things or we just got smart and know that you have to bleed the animal? Pro um, hmm. Maybe some of both. Probably some of both. Probably some of both. Um... 
I guess you, you guys are dry aging that maybe. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe we realize that that blood could make us sick. I don't know. Um, well, it comes to our mind when we were reading this because we each lived in the era where our farm background we, you know, hung the animal up and I don't know how long did it have to hang the day. Did Wisconsin they did that for the deer during deer hunting and a lot of people mm -hmm. did it in a garage. Yeah, yeah. wherever you eat yeah. them now. Yeah, you know, so. yeah, yeah, because a lot of times you do it in the field because you don't want to drag that extra weight around. <laughs> um, or, or they took it to the just right to the processing center and they took care yeah. of everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So now, yeah. now one deer hunter in the family and. That's what, that's what he does, yeah. Well, and almost makes an appointment in a, anticipating. I don't, think, I don't think they want the blood in there as long as it takes to get them to the processing center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they, they, uh, they bleed them out in the field. Yeah. Okay. Most I, of them, I think. Yeah, I'm sure that would cause some damage to the meat. I think it does uh, compromise the quality of the meat. Yeah. Now, wow. um, when I was growing up, uh, in Polish people have this dish called chalina, which is basically duck blood soup. And I wasn't gonna eat that at all. But my my mom and her dad, her family, they love that stuff. I wasn't eating that. Disgusting. Where do they get the blood from for that? You buy it from the butcher. Or if you had ducks, you, <laughs> you did it by yourself. <laughs> I had an aunt that when they butchered, they would always save the blood, and they made what they called blood pudding, and uh, they would eat it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. That, that's an English thing, right? Is, Pardon? Is well, that a, is that an English thing? Blood pudding? Maybe English, maybe because yeah. yeah. I I think though people just did not want to waste a bit of an animal. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's money. That hey, yes. Yeah. Mary Lou trying to get in. I oh, okay. Guess, Got it. For a little bit. Thank okay. you. There she goes. Okay. See. She'll be yeah, popping in shortly. There yeah. she comes. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll add Mary Lou to the listing so she'll get an invite. Alright, so um, yeah, and, and to Christy's point, a lot of people in, in a lot of cultures, you waste nothing. Um, that was our back then. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Pickled big pig's feet. Oh, yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, Head cheese. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was a treat. Pickles big. It was a treat? It was a treat, yeah. A treat. I, I think I was the only one in the family that liked them. Well, I, I would have given you my share. Thank you very much. Well, another another thing that, that I great, ate growing up was called kishka. And they called it blood sausage. And I didn't actually read the label until after we were married. Because I told Christy, I said, oh, yeah, we used to eat this all the time. I love it. It's, it's peppery, a real peppery sausage. And I read the ingredients... And of course, there was blood in there, pig lips, pig ears. So it sounded like they just took the whole pig and threw it in a grinder and then put it in a casing at the other end. So I don't eat that anymore. No, I never bought it again. <laughs> never bought it again. But so of course they wouldn't throw the good parts in there. No, no. Why would they? <laughs> the leftovers. That was the leftovers. Yeah. yeah. So a word to the wise. Yes, you had a cat. Yeah, <laughs> I could tell you stories, <laughs> but I won't. I won't. Move on. Move on. Moving on. Hi, Mary Lou. How are you? Oh, your mic's muted. Hi, your your mic. Up there. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are you? Okay. We're. Um, I'm I'm doing real well. I just joined. It sounds like you're talking about strange foods from the past. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're in the Bible. <laughs> because we, we we just we just walked through the section of um, how we can't eat blood and and how we shouldn't boil baby goats and mother's milk, 
and that led us to to quite a quite a good discussion. So mm -hmm. now now that I have your email, I'll send you an invitation for next week so you can join us right at the start. Okay. Oh, thank you. That that's not why I didn't join up right at the start. I'm I'm here. I'm busy and disorganized. <laughs> okay. <laughs> None of us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That this uh, yeah this isolation causes uh, some disorganization. All right, so we're in Deuteronomy 15, the year of canceling debts, and God tells us at the end of every seven years you must cancel debts. Um, and when you think about what happens. Um, every week on the seventh day, what God is saying is, you every seven years you get a chance to rest from your debts. Because think Wouldn't of that be nice. <laughs> well, think of how how stressed some people get if they're very if they're very much in debt. It's a very stressful thing. So God is saying every seven years, all the lenders have to cancel all debts. There's there's nothing out there. Um, verse three. Got, are debtor prisons today. Yeah, debtor prisons, and of course, there's uh, refinancing, or you just gotta stick it out. Reverse mortgage. I just heard a thing about that today. Of that. Ah. Well, but then you would do bankruptcy if you can't pay it back, right? Yeah. You can. And that has that has its own restrictions. You, it's hard to buy anything ever again, but uh, that takes us down a different path. <clears throat> but God is saying that you only have to cancel debts for Israelites. You don't have to do it for foreigners. Verse three tells us you may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt to your feather, fellow Israelite. And um, what we're going to learn more about loans in ancient Jewish culture in Deuteronomy chapter 15. We went through this in Leviticus, but we're going to get a, a refresher in Deuteronomy, not 15, 22. Ah, I've got the wrong reference there. Okay, so I think it's Deuteronomy 22. We'll get to that later. Um, however, God says in verse 4, 15, 4, there need be no poor people among you. God says he will richly bless you if only you fully obey the Lord your God. So what, what God had in mind when he established the, the Israelite society is that the people who were, were abundantly blessed with uh, finance or, or talents to earn a lot of income, they were supposed to share it with everybody else. And God would richly bless them Verse 5, if only you fully obey the Lord your God. And we know that never happened because people never fully obeyed God. We don't, we, they didn't do it back then. We don't do it now. So we don't have all the blessings that God intends for us. Just a little lesson. Um, and then God tells us, you will lend to many nations, but you will borrow from none. So God is telling the Israelites, you can loan money to other countries, but you are not to borrow from anybody. A couple reasons for that. First reason is, God is saying that I'm providing everything for you. You don't need anything else that I don't give you. And when you think about it, it's true. The, the more we desire things, the more we get into financial trouble. Um, back in the day before they had credit cards, People either did without or they saved up before they bought something. But then credit cards came along and people just plopped down the plastic and they got in trouble. God's saying you don't need to borrow from anybody. But we do. Okay, let's see here. Um, verse 11. Yeah, verse 11. Uh, Therefore I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. God's saying you need to share with the, the poor. He says there's always going to be poor people for one reason or another. Um, maybe through death in the family, they, they can't generate enough income, or maybe something happens where they get ill, they can't generate enough income, or something else happens. 
God's saying, if you have it, you need to share it. Freeing servants. Now here, the, the servants that they're talking about, these are about the debt slaves that Rich was talking about earlier. And it, it, people got into situations where sometimes their life was so bad that they couldn't afford things, they would sell themselves to be a servant. And back in the day, even through, through Roman times, well, even after that, um, the majority of people were poor. They didn't have anything. Very few people were rich. And a lot of people sold themselves into slavery. I think it was estimated that maybe 90% of the people during Roman times were actually slaves because they couldn't afford anything else and they made themselves slaves. Of course, there were... My uh, internet connection is acting up. If I, if I lose you, I may have to sign back in. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay, but in the seventh year, you are to set them free. Once again, we see the Sabbath attitude coming up. Um, the seventh day, we celebrate the Sabbath. Here in the seventh year, we need to let people go free, the debt slaves. And notice in verse 13, God says, And when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. A um, couple reasons for that. God wanted them to not fall back into slavery. God is hoping that if you give these people um, a step up or a helping hand, they can take care of themselves. Also, think back to um, when they were getting out of Egypt, how the Egyptians gave them everything they asked for to get rid of them. So God is saying, you do the same thing. When you release your slaves, you have to take care of them like the Egyptians took care of you with a little prodding from God. Verse 16 and 17. But if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you, then take an owl, an awl, you know, that, that sharp piece of metal with a handle on it. So take it and jam it in your servant's ear, the earlobe, so that they would be permanently marked. So, you know, those kids walking around with those gauges, those big holes in their ears. Maybe that's where it came from. Anyway, God did this for two reasons. One was so people could, could see that this is a servant for life, that he was um, working for the this, this slave master. And the second reason, God's reason, was that um, the slave owner couldn't just kick out the slave when they got old or disabled. Because, of course, that happened a lot. Um, when the slaves get old, they would just probably dump them off somewhere and let them starve. Here God says, this person has worked for you for their entire life. You need to take care of them now. So that's the second reason they were marked. Um, any questions so far? Doing good? Is this where the... Okay, I don't see anything in here about fields. How you should let them rest every seven years. No, um, because... That's another part, right? Um, we might see that again, but remember, uh, Deuteronomy is going to be focused on the, the Ten Commandments. So we might see that when we get to the, the section about the Sabbath. Okay, when we, talk, when we get into detail about the Fourth Commandment, that okay. might pop up, letting the land rest. Is that Talia there? Yeah, I better let her in before she scratches the carpet. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Okay, get you. Okay. Betsy's putting pizza in the oven for us. Okay. Oh, dinner. Yeah. So. What, what are, yeah, yeah, Betsy wants to know one or two pizzas. Oh, two. Yeah, they, this is the cat's tail. Okay. I, I'm not growing hair. <laughs> I don't want it. Um, okay, so firstborn animals in verse 19. Set apart for the Lord your God every firstborn. And like I said before, this is to, to indicate the first fruits that we were to give to God. That we got love God so much and honor Him that we'll give up the first that we have. The best that we have. Um mm -hmm. And that comes from Exodus chapter 13, verse 2. 
Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. <laughs> Sorry. She uh, must be a firstborn. Okay, <laughs> that's all I can say about that cat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That means God can have her at any time. Any time. Any time. <laughs> I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Um, so, and God goes on. He says that we shouldn't get any benefit from the firstborn. He says, do not put your firstborn of your cows to work. Do not shear the firstborn of your sheep. Because every part of that animal belongs to God. How about milk? And, you know, that you can make, no, you can't I, milk the cow? I would say no. I would say no because it belongs to God. Huh. Okay. Now, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see those. Wasn't there a time in Catholic families when the firstborn was supposed to either be a priest or a nun? Yep. Did everyone hear that? Yep. That was supposed to be me. <laughs> yeah. But, no, I, I, I did not hear it. Okay, so Jeanette said, wasn't there um, the case in Catholic families that the firstborn was supposed to be a priest? Or and, a nun. Or a nun, and in a lot of families that was true. Um, I was supposed to be a priest, and I was actually thinking about it until I got to high school and saw that girls come in all different colors, and from all different neighborhoods. And I said, eh, I don't like this idea too much. Plus, then I, the more, the more I heard about the theology, the less I believed it. And I, um, I told, in senior year in high school, I told my theology teacher that he was full of, uh, full of crap. Theology. Full of crap. And he flunked me. So, uh, because I, I just couldn't believe what he was telling me. So that was that was the start of my uh, rejection of those beliefs. So yeah, we were raised Catholic. Yeah. So. And and but I have to say that uh, being raised Catholic gave me a, a very solid um, foundation. You know, there there are some things that that I don't believe that they believe, but a lot of it uh, a lot of it is biblical um, because they do read the Bible. Uh, but there's some other things that that uh, that I don't believe in, so um, we just we just leave it at that. So um, that's it. It's we've gone through Deuteronomy 13 through 15, and this is the detail for the the first commandment. And like I said, we're going to see through all all of Deuteronomy how um, how detailed we get in this discussion of the Ten Commandments. Okay. Anything else? Go ahead. How many chapters are there in Deuteronomy? There are 34. Looking at my handy dandy Deuteronomy poster. Out real low, three. Still, still, still available at on the front of the church. The mathematician says it doesn't work out doing in threes. I said I didn't bother me. <laughs> yeah, we we. Might speed up, we'll see, but I, I don't like speeding up um, too much because the, the, I think the more time we, we spend in the Bible, the deeper we can go and we won't gloss over anything. So as you guys read through, um, read through the Bible, as we go through our three chapters, try to focus on things that you have questions about. Because that, that's how I go through the Bible. When I read things, and something bothers me or I have a question, that's when I, I really dive deep. So anything that pops up that you have questions about, um, and if I don't have the answer right away, I'll get it for you and we'll talk about it the next class. Um, after we get through Deuteronomy, that's when we'll, we'll go to Matthew. Because we made the decision um, a couple months ago to, to do an Old Testament chapter, then a New Testament chapter. Oh. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, and That's then we'll, a nice idea. Yeah, because what we'll see is we'll see how the uh, what the Old Testament talks about will be reflected in the New Testament, either through the um, the, the prophecies that come through true mm -hmm. through true Jesus, or 
um, just how often it's referenced. And Matthew is a good chapter to go through because Matthew um, was writing to the Jews. So we're going to see a lot of references to the Old Testament when we get to Matthew. Um, so I think it'll be a good exercise. And it'll keep us fresh. Uh, because sometimes if we stay in the Old Testament too long, uh, we, we tend to lose sight of where things ended up. But it'll be good. It'll be good. I saw the dog. <laughs> I did. Bubba wants to talk to your cat. Yeah. No, his dog wants to talk to you. Oh, she's down at this level now. Yeah, Sugar's decided to visit. Very good. Very, Very good. for everybody. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yay. Do we have any uh, prayer concerns for the prayer meeting tomorrow? Oh, what, Jeanette? Good seeing people, she said. Absolutely. Oh, I miss everybody. everybody. Yeah. It's yeah. nice to see all of you with no mask. I was at Walmart today. I wasn't sure who I was talking to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of scary. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Um, are are any of the women uh, putting on lipstick before putting the mask <laughs> over it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> chapstick. A lot of chapstick lately. But. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. But Jeanette, do you want to come into the prayer group tomorrow morning? Oh, on Facebook? Um, it'll be on Zoom. Jim can send you an invite well, and then um, he'll call you and put you on speakerphone. Okay, because my phone isn't working on anything right now. Okay, okay. that's okay. Okay. One of, one of the prayers that I think that you could offer up. I, I have, I, I think a concern about this is they're starting to think ahead. Um, regardless of what happens with the educational structure, when we get time to go into the next fall, there's this problem or concern of how do we handle the kids because they miss so much of this year to uh, carry them over and into the next year. Do they bring them in? For instance, an example would be bring them into the same grade they were in this year let them spend some time to end up there and then go on to the next grade level or what is a good way that um, and I think the people need some help and uh, uh -huh. in opinions on what they think would be the best for the children because that's yeah. what it's all about. Yeah, okay. and, and Wilbur brings up a good point in talking to the FCA kids, they have no finals this year. So pretty much they're, they're going through their classes but they're they're not testing their knowledge. They're not seeing if if, if they've actually learned what they're supposed to learn. Yes. Yeah. An, another um, population that's going to be hurt by this are the special needs kids. Like um, I know one family that has two autistic children. Um, they're so out of the school attitude that their parents aren't sure they can ever get them back into school. Oh, wow. So there's there's a lot of a lot of things that are that are tied up in this whole coronavirus deal. Well I know a lot of the colleges are gonna do only online. Harvard started today. They said in the fall we will only meet online. Yeah. For their medical um, there were three schools yeah. in Harvard. Huh. And but I did hear him say also that currently 70% of the higher education schools are planning on on-campus classes next fall. That's huh. now. They can change that quickly. But. Yeah. Well, August, Augustana is because they said they have small groups of kids. They can do this. They can pull it off. Sure. So um, I'd like to offer up prayers for Betsy. She's moving out June 1st. So, a lot of prayers. Um, her and her four roommates are get they're on a house uh, right off campus. It's part of the procedure they go through for, as seniors. And they're moving in, and I just reserved the U-Haul. So, I'm just very nervous. So, I think we need to pray for you, too, huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But she we'll, pray, we'll pray for you, too. We have a granddaughter in Orlando. And she lives in a house, and she is the, well, we'll say owner of the house. Two other girls live with her. She said her uh, academics are coming along beautifully. Her adulting is very hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Betsy has a job interview at Chipotle tomorrow in Bettendorf. Oh, so we're going to drive day. over, yeah, and um, she needs a summer job, she said, because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm there. I have to pay rent. I'm like, uh -huh. yeah. 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 That's, yeah. that's what's happening. <laughs> My granddaughter works at Disney, and Disney's closed. Ah, well, they opened Shanghai Disney. Did you see Yes. It? Yes, and they opened Disney Springs, which is the commercial uh, touristy souvenir.